Suratul Ahqaf named the sand dunes, which is the location of the people of Ad, as the Quran says, Wathkur Akha Ad, Ith Anzara Qawmahu Bil Ahqaf, Waqad Khalat Al Nuduru Min Baini Yadayhi Wa Min Khalfihi Allah Ta'abudu Illa Allah. That remember the brother of the people of Ad, when he warned his people at the sand dunes. This was towards the south of Arabia. And time and again we've mentioned the Quran speaks about bygone nations and the universal message and the cycle, the trend of sending prophets, defiance and consequentially the destruction of the people. And many times the Quran uses in terms of geography and geographical re relevance, those locations that are close to the people of the addressed community, in this case, the Quraysh. So the addressees are located in Arabia. So the Quran talks about the people of Thamud, which are based northwards. And the people of Ad, who are based further south towards the side of Yemen. And the Arab prophets among them was Sayyidina Shu'ib alayhi salam, alayhi salatu was salam, Sayyidina Hud, and Sayyidina Salih alayhi salam. So there's a relevance on multiple fronts here. As we know, in terms of the number of prophets that were sent the Quran, states as we read two days ago وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُولًا مِّن قَبْلِكَ مِنْهُمْ مَّنْ قَصَصْنَا عَلَيْكَ وَمِنْهُمْ مَّنْ لَمْ نَقْصُصْ عَلَيْكَ that we sent messengers before you O Prophet of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم some of them their narratives and stories we have related to you and some of them we have withheld or we haven't narrated their stories and narratives to you in other words every community was sent a messenger because the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that we do not punish and we are not ones to chastise until we have sent a messenger. Why? لِأَلَّا يَكُونَ لِلنَّاسِ عَلَى اللَّهِ حُجَّةٌ بَعْدُ الرُّسُلِ The reason messengers are sent is so that the people may have may be left with no justifiable argument or case to present for their ignorance and for their disbelief. That's why the Rusul, the messengers of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, they are sent and only subsequent to their defiance and disobedience does the punishment follow. So in Surah Al-Ahqaf the story of Sayyidina Hud alayhi salatu wasalam with his people is mentioned. Thereafter, we read Surah Muhammad. In Surah Muhammad, one of the verses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he instructs the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, saying, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكَ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ That know that there is no deity and there is no object of worship, there is no object and source of divinity except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the Prophet وسلم, is instructed that that seek repentance for your misdoing. For the prophets, when they are instructed to seek repentance, it's only to raise their status and ranks with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Such is the awareness of the Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam, such a presence they have of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and such an awareness, a deep-rooted gnosis and ma'rif of Allah ta'ala that as they climb the ranks and as they draw close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they always become aware of a rank ahead 
and one ahead and one ahead and the one that they are upon when they see the rank that is further beyond them they see that to be inferior to the one that still stands before them so for them just the ascent in ranks and the fact that these ranks are inexhaustible as it is said that hasanatul abrar sayyatul muqarrabin that the good deeds of the righteous people are considered the sins of those who are in the divine proximity, those that have been drawn into the elite people of Allah Ta'ala. An example of this is how we have the protocols of royalty. Those people who are within the royal circle, they follow certain protocols which if the laity and the public were to follow, it be deemed a breach of propriety, it'd be, it'd be deemed a breach of proper conduct, even though such a behavior is normal and acceptable. Yet, as you climb the ladder, there, there is a proportionate increase in one's conduct and one's behavior and what is expected of a person. So the messenger is not, alayhi salatu wasalam, he's not being instructed to repent for a misdoing in the same way that we have misdoings in the form of sins. The, the prophets, are f they are far clear and they are far beyond sinning in the way we understand. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاسْتَغْفِلْ لِذَنْبِكَ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ And seek forgiveness for the believing men and the believing women. Istighfar is one of the practices of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In one hadith he mentions that I seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala up to 70 times a day. In another narration, up to 100 times. And on many occasions, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would publicly do certain or carry out certain practices for the sake of instructing and nurturing the ummah because if he was seen doing something and the ummah saw him carrying out such an action it would spur them on it would encourage them to follow suit even though the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did not require himself to be in that position of seeking such a forgiveness so for instance, we know when there is a fatherly figure and when he has to come down to the level of the child or when, he's, when, when a person is trying to harness an animal and trying to make them or make the animal subservient to his needs, he comes down to the level of the animal, he makes certain sounds or he speaks in the language of the child in a mimicking manner that and he is the child. So in the same way, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's the shepherd of his community. He shepherds the Ummah. And the Ummah is the flock of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he would seek forgiveness up to a hundred times a day. In one hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentions, مَنْ لَزِمَ الْإِسْتِغْفَارَ جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لَهُ مِنْ كُلِّ ضَيْقٍ مَخْرَجًا وَمِنْ كُلِّ هَمٍ فَرَجًا Three benefits the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He mentions with regards to doing the istighfar or asking repentance from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Whoever abundantly clings on to or whoever clings on to istighfar Whoever abundantly recites the istighfar Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah Three things the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam guarantees. Allah Ta'ala will create for him a source of deliverance, a source of release and an exit and a way out of every trialing circumstance, every testing circumstance. وَمِن كُلِّ هَمِّ فَرَجَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will create for him an opening. This is the second guarantee. Allah ta'ala will create for him an opening from every source of grief and sadness. 
And number three, the guarantee of sustenance. وَرَزَقَهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبُ Allah Ta'ala will sustain him. He will provide him sustenance from sources he did not even imagine. This is the benefit and the virtue of abundantly saying the istighfar. And there's many levels of istighfar. One can be walking around and just with his tongue doing the istighfar. But then there's one where one sits down, he absorbs himself, he's taking stock of himself, he meticulously brings to mind all of his past misdoings, he laments over them, he grieves over his past actions, and then he says the istighfar. This is much more effective. The first one, one can be walking around, and rather than staying silent, his tongue remains moist with seeking repentance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is istighfar also. But a higher level is taking out that time and contemplating over one's past doings. That's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was asked, hey, man najatu ya Rasulullah? What is the source of salvation, O Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa So he responded, amsik alayka lisanak, that keep or restrain your tongue. Let your house be spacious for you. Let your house be capacious for you. Meaning, let your house be the place that you occupy most frequently. It's no good to unnecessarily wander out. Especially in times of trials and Tribulations to keep one's iman safe. And the third one, wabki ala khati'atik, and cry over your sins. These are the sources of salvation. In one astounding narration, the Prophet ﷺ, he states that the person who asks forgiveness for the believing men and the believing women, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will write for him one good deed in exchange for every living male believer and every living male, uh, sorry, female believer. Now, you can do the calculation. If, even if we put the number at one and a half billion Muslims in total. Just saying, Allahumma ghfil lana walil mu'mina wal mu'minat. Oh Allah, forgive us and forgive the believing men and forgive the believing women. That is automatically one and a half billion rewards that one has secured for himself. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's calculations are boundless. There is the multiplication for every good deed tenfold and then in the month of Ramadan seventyfold and then based on one's varying level or based on the varying levels of Iman anywhere from ten to seven hundred and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the innumerable extent and the boundless rewards that one is capable of achieving just by seeking forgiveness for the believing men and the believing women. So this was one of the verses that we read, recited today, فَعَلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكَ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ Know that there is no deity except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seek forgiveness for your misdoings and for the believers, men and women. Even to translate in, the, in respect of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the term dhamb as misdoing is inaccurate. Because the prophets don't carry out any misdoings. But for the lack of, or for the lack of a better term, we, or this term has been used. Then we recited Surah Al-Fatih very briefly. This surah summarizes one of the key events in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Taala Alaihi Wasallam. The Treaty of Hudaybiyah. 
this was a long, this is a long story. And to summarize, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after staying for many years in Madinatul Munawwara, he and his companions decided that they would return once more to Makkatul Mukarramah to perform Umrah. And along the way, the Mushrikeen, the polytheists of Mecca, they felt that this was an affront, this was a deep cut on their pride that how can we let the Muslims into Makkatul Mukarramah. And the Muslims were eager to, com to complete the Umrah that year. But for, and based on the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Mushrikeen, they obstructed their entrance and a treaty was signed, which was a very lopsided treaty, wherein the Muslims, they acceded and they accepted certain terms and conditions which were very, very one-sided and much more favorable to the Mushrikun. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls this treaty and this occasion of the, uh, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, one of the terms of the treaty stated that the Muslims would not perform the Umrah this year, but they'd have to go back. And the Muslims even accepted this condition, even though there was no need or there was no reason for them to be obstructed. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls this event a victory. Thus, even the Sahaba, some of the Sahaba, they were quite upset at the fact that such conditions had to be accepted. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls this, treat this treaty a victory. Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. That indeed, we have granted you an open victory. And this was perplexing to some of the Sahaba. This is a victory. But when we look at the numbers, how many Muslims took the pledge under the tree? Because prior to the treaty being signed, Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was sent into Mecca to negotiate some terms. But a rumor had spread that he had been <coughs> slain. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he took the pledge of all the Muslims that they would avenge this death. And at the time, approximately 1,400 Sahaba were present. But then when we look at the numbers, when the Muslims came back another time, a year or two later, and they performed the Umrah on the occasion of Fathu Makkah, the conquest of Makkah, the victory of Makkah. That's why some of the Sahaba would say, many of you consider this verse, inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. One of the Sahaba mentioned that you consider this conquering or this conquest to be the conquest of Makkah. But we consider it to be the conquest or the victory of Hudaybiyah. Even though on face value, Hudaybiyah and the treaty that was signed seemed to be a defeat for the Muslims. Yet there were 1,400 Muslims who took the pledge. Yet on the event or on the occasion of the conquest, so many thousands of Sahaba entered. So in a space of two years or just less, how many you know, the, 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 the conditions of the treaty were such that it, it gave the Muslims breathing space. It gave, it gave them leg room. Now there was little to worry about from the sides of the polities. And there was an open field for da'wah. And so many entered the fold of Islam such that when the Muslims did actually enter Mecca and perform the Umrah, so many thousands more had already entered the fold of Islam. So this was an open victory. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ Sometimes you might like, dislike something, yet it is good for you. وَعَسَىٰ أَن تُحِبُّ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ شَرٌ لَكُمْ It may be the case that you like something, yet it is bad for you. But وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the true reality of things. And you, don't, you do not know. So this seemingly outward looking form of defeat was in fact a victory through and through. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the conquest and the treaty of Hudaybiyah in great detail. The surah details the events around 
the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Thereafter, we read Surah Al-Hujurat and Surah Al-Qaf. In there, we are in Surah Al-Hujurat, the chambers, the rooms of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We are being disciplined and we are being cultured in the sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu la tarfa'u aswatakum fawqa sawtin nabi. That all oh, believers do not raise your voices above the voices of the messenger. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In other words, the sahaba when they spoke to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they had to ensure that they engage with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with of attitude of reverence and this verse not to raise your voices above the voices of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam it applies to us also we don't put our whims and desires and our voices we don't make ourselves heard when the decree and when the instructions and the orders of the Quran and the Sunnah the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are before us this is the Quran is teaching us many etiquettes and Adab in this surah. Thereafter, we <coughs> recited Surah Tuqaf. In Surah Tuqaf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He talks about one of the <coughs> lasting issues of the mushrikun, the fact of life after death and their denial of this fact. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about how the pangs of death will ultimately befall every person. That the pangs of death will surely come and it will be said to the person that this is what you were trying to escape. And in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, a complimentary verse that فَلَوْلَا إِذَا بَلَغَتِ الْحُلْقُومَ وَأَنْتُمْ حِينَ إِذٍ تَنْظُرُونَ وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْكُمْ وَلَكِنْ لَا تُبُصِرُونَ That if you really think that there is nothing beyond death then why don't you stop or forestall and preempt the very act of death itself when the soul reaches the throat and everybody around the dying person is observing helplessly watching as the final moments fade away and the person starts to lose grip or lose his grip with life and everyone around whether it's a doctor whether it's the richest business tycoon, whoever it may be, everyone encircles the dying person completely helpless. Allah Ta'ala says in that surah, then why isn't it when the soul reaches the throat and you are all observing at the time, فَلَوْلَا إِن كُنْتُمْ غَيْرَ مَدِينِينَ تَرَجِعُونَهَا إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ That if you aren't now going to be taken to task and if there isn't going to be a resurrection and there is no accountability, then tarji'oonaha in kuntum sadiqeen restore the soul, push it back down stop it from leaving the body but this helplessness that man brags in, on the earth for the short period that he's here he behaves as if he's here forever and that there is nothing beyond this life Allah Ta'ala tells us that if that is really the case then why are you so helpless? why can't you escape with your numbers and your strength this one helpless person and this one soul leaving the body, what's the matter? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the stage of death and all the stages to follow thereafter in Surah Tuqaf. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to prepare in the month of Ramadan for our death. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to live our life like Ramadan so that our death may come like Eid. You know, it's said, that when you are born, you enter the world crying whilst everyone around you is laughing. So let it be that when you leave the world, you are laughing while everyone around you is crying.